We'll also be offering after hours event space. So if you're looking for space to come and host a workshop or an event, um, you can certainly check with us as well. Uh, our, our, our grand opening is going to be on January 15th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We'd like to invite all of you to join us. We'd love to have you. Uh, 3.30 is our ribbon cutting ceremony, and we're going to have refreshments, tours, and of course networking. So we'd love to have you there. And if you would like, I'll leave some cards on the back table if you're interested in knowing more about us, so you can have our link to our website. But it's llcoworking at corley.com. Thank you. We have uh, minutes for some questions. Oh, what sure. is uh, video conferencing capabilities you plan to have? We do. We actually have a podcast room. Thank you for asking that question. We have a podcast room, um, so you can actually do your own podcasting or webinars. But we'll also have in the conference rooms cameras, and you can do video conferencing in the conference rooms as well. Mm -hmm. What are the cost to the uh, idea of like, yeah, membership? It ranges. We have a lot, wide variety. So full-time membership would be office members. So if you, if you uh, are a member of an office, then um, you have 24-7 access. Um, and you have so many credits per month for the credit for, for the conference rooms or uh, the rental res user goal resources. Um, we also have just as little as four times a month. So let's say you're not really sure how this co-working thing is going to work out for you. That's month to month, and you can come as little as four times a month. I think it's seventy-five dollars for a month to month. The office space requires a one-year commitment, but it includes. The electricity, your internet, and light and a toilet. Meaning, with your garbage, you're not going to go. <laughs> you're not going to go in your office and clean your office. <laughs> Any other questions? So January 18th. 15th, 15th is that the grand opening. We actually open on the second. So we are January. So January 15th is our grand opening. We mm have -hmm. tours and. And then it's on the second. I'm sorry. In business on the second. In business on the second. Opening the doors. We have people actually, some members already signed up and they don't be moving in the week before. Do you have a website that has the other question? Yes. LLCoworking.corelink.com. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can sign up pre sign up. Yes. We are accepting pre sign up now. Community members can just, even if you just want to be a four time a month person, which is a flex membership, you can sign up in the community now. Just so I know that you want to be part of the community. And then once January 2nd comes, you upgrade your membership to whatever membership you want. Chris, no, I just want to say thanks for recognizing the need in this community. I know I'm constantly seeing people on the, on the Facebook community pages working on trying to space prior to work from home. Um, space and the portal's full. Um, and so, Thank you for joining us cool. and then you. taking advantage of it. You know, obviously, it's great. This is for, for yourself and your family, and um, you know, we have you can be full before you know it. We hope so. I, I also really want to compliment Sean. This is back in the 90s when we were looking at starting a small business, checking it out of the home. I was able to get involved in something similar to this. And it was amazing that, as you say, the productivity is at home. There's two things always not in the way. TV and refrigerator. <laughs> then what was is it really added credibility to our business starting out, and it was very advantageous. So I, I wish you a lot of success. Oh, thank you very much. Excellent for us. Yes, good. Yeah, not only that is the lawn needs to be mowed. That's kind of another distraction. <laughs> <laughs> when you're at home. And oh. kids and <laughs> kids. dogs. Yeah. Dog. And the UPS guy comes all every day almost to my house. <laughs> so, any yeah, other questions? Yeah, I know. Yeah, right. The dog's feeding you. And thank you for oh, thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, board and report. So, friends of the library, library board here. Planning commission. Parks and Arts Commission. And then you guys I'm running out of boards and commissions here. So, uh, anything else to use? Yeah. Okay.
So why are we here? Well, I know that. He's the next one. Yeah, our new special guest is by Jimmy and Bill. And I know that you're going to talk about the water issue that we had in the last week and the success that you had in Sir. So, what's important in this community, right? Do we know now that water is the key to what goes on in this community? So we had an incident that, that never happened. It was so I get a call from Bajay. He's somewhere in Montana, and I don't think he knows where he is. He says, we have a boil water. I'm not there. So, that, that began our uh, 10, 15 day saga uh, to try to solve a problem that we never encountered before. So, I just want to say I want to compliment by the work that he did personally and on our crews and our support staff. They worked a tremendous number of hours to get this situation resolved. So, with that, I just I'll give you a rundown on what exactly. Yeah, so we haven't been busy the last week, really. <laughs> um, I actually quizzed one of my operator, my chief operator, on how many hours that he's put in in the last seven days, and that number is 144. So, um, pretty staggering amount of time that he's spent. Um, if you recall, we've been working on this. We've been, so in that individual in particular hasn't had a day off since the 3rd of November, because um, we did each and late cleanup that first weekend. And then the next weekend, we found the first E. coli samples that were restricted to just two residences. Um, that's what triggered all of this, is we did an investigative sample on a fire hydrant that served, was on a water main that served two residences, um, because one of those residences was having a difficult time. They opened their, their line a number of times, um, and they had a difficult time getting clear back keys. And so they said, well, you know, can you check your fire hydrant? So we did. And to our surprise, we found E. coli there. Um, it's a fire hydrant, so you don't take a lot of merit to that because you get a lot of false positives from fire hydrants. They're open to the environment, they're open to exposure, all kinds of exposures. And so um, we retested that fire hydrant, it came back clean. Confusion even more in our regard. So uh, what we ended up doing in addition is we collected five other samples from fire hydrants that were upstream of that. Um, we got two more E. coli hits um, and, a couple, and a couple of total coliform hits. Um, that really prompted us to say that there's something more going on here. Um, we were a little bit confused when the first fire hydrant had E. coli and then the very next sample after we did nothing operationally it came back clean. That made us think that it was a false positive, but until we found the other samples going up that line. Still limited to just those two residences. Contact the Department of Health. Um, they're the authority on jurisdiction of you know these types of things and what do we do well you need to put a boil water order on those two residences we did just that they were notified immediately of the first one incidentally um, so from there we did additional sampling upstream upstream which would be to the west um, going out into like the Stonehill area um, and then also into the industrial area off of north of East Appleway um, and south of I-90. So we collected a lot of investigative samples in there. Um, and over the course of the next two days, those all came back clean. So, um, you know, we had these initial samples on the 16th, but the 17th, 18th, and um, the 17th and 18th, those, all those samples, investigative samples we collected upstream were all clean and clear. So that didn't prompt us to get too awful concern. We stayed pretty localized to what was going on there, continued to sample. Um, and then on, we collected more samples on the 19th, and that's in that uh, adjacent commercial area. And we got an additional uh, E. coli sample from uh, your Delta location. So when we received that, we thought something was definitely um, um, you know, unique and going on. So we talked to the Department of Health. We said as a precautionary, we don't know how widespread this could be. Um, let's issue a boil water advisory for our entire district. We did that on the 20th. Um, within five hours, we had that notice out the door. Problems that we experienced at that time were um, 
Department of Health had released a, an action alert um, incorrectly with the wrong date. So a lot of people were like, what are you hiding? You should have locked, issued this notice three days ago. Well, it was three days ago, we were getting samples. They were clean and they were really only limited to those two residences. We had that completely isolated off and they were out of service during that time. Um, so we continued to sample both where we were finding the E. coli sample and then widespread across our district. And we were finding satisfactory samples and all of those as well. Um, if my date's correct, the last week's been a blur. It was the 21st, we got another E. coli hit from uh, Christian Brothers Automotive. Um, and then uh, that prompted us what we ended up, we had it pretty much isolated both hydraulically. So that area, and to our blessing, that area of that commercial development north of East Appleway, South by 90, is in a different pressure zone. It's a much lower elevation. So all the water is going that way. It's not coming out, out to the city unless we had major main breaks, which we didn't have. So all the water was able to go that way. Um, we were also able to control it. So we, we had chlorinated the two reservoirs that were feeding that area, um, our 1 million and 2 million gallon reservoirs. We also switched our wells. We switched our wells to be able to provide water to that area. And then we opened up the hydrants to create draw. And so what we did end up doing is we ended up um, hydraulically isolating that area so all the water was going north rather than south. Um, that enabled us to protect the rest of the residences um, and enabled us to collect samples. The difficulty with the samples are is they're a 24 hour turnaround time. So if you don't know what your actions today are realized until tomorrow. Um, and so what we ended up doing by um, isolating that area hydraulically, we're able to chlorinate the reservoirs to feed that area. Um, not knowing what was going on in the south without those sample results back, we also chlorinated the rest of our reservoirs um, and chlorinated the entire system. For a non-chlorinated system, um, we feel very strongly we want to remain a non-chlorinated system. Our customers have expressed to us that they want us to remain a non-chlorinated system. And we were pretty much presented with an ultimatum from the Department of Health. And that ultimatum was, if you want to be a chlorinated system, we can relieve this boil water for you in like two days time. Or, which is, you put in your chlorinators and you start chlorinating your wells and you get clear samples and you're off of the races and, and you're a forever chlorinated system. And we said, no, we feel very strongly we want to remain a non-chlorinated system. So what we ended up having to do was flush all that chlorine out of our system. We had to be a non-chlorinated system like we were, have all the chlorine out for 24 hours, and you had to get consecutive back-to-back -back samples. So flush the chlorine out, let it sit for 24 hours, collect a representative sample across the district, get results of those if they're satisfactory, you collect, that's 24 hour period again, incidentally, you collect a second set of samples if they're satisfactory, then you can lift the order. So that was the process. But we also, um, in that additional sampling that we were collecting during this time, we got a couple more E. coli hits in that isolated commercial area from um, up in the uh, McKinsey Lane, North McKinsey Lane, two of them there, and then another one out in the hydrant um, out of the Stonehill area. We also had that pretty much isolated as well. So what we did when we got those other hits is we, had, we went from being hydrologi hy hydraulically isolating that section with flow we ended up physically isolating it. So we asked the city's help to block off that north, that northbound lane of East Appleway, and we, we valved that whole area off with valves. And so that water was water was going in and there was nowhere to go. It's not gonna go out. And so um, we were in direct conversation with each and every one of the commercial um, buildings and businesses in that area. We had, uh, and what we ended up doing is kind of treating those as two separate systems, two separate water systems in a sense, because they really function that way. And we were able to super chlorinate, hyper chlorinate that commercial area. Um, and because of that, um, the consequence was is we had to turn all those water services off. Um, because you can't have a hotel, for instance, with hyper chlorinated water and people showering, not a good thing. So we weren't very popular by shutting the hotel and evacuating all the people. Um, but also we were very popular with sending 600 people in Huntwood home for the day either. So, but you know, it was measures that we had to take in order to protect our customers and public health. Um, 
So we isolated it off physically. We super chlorinated in that area. Um, at the same time, we were dealing with the rest of our district collecting samples. All those were coming back satisfactory. Collect the first well, we had flush. We asked for customers' help to help us flush. We got um, good flushing as a result of that. And, and little tidbit of how powerful social media can be is we put a call for action. I don't know if you guys saw that. Call for action to run water in your bathtubs for a couple hours. Well, we have a treatment plan, and we can see the results of these, uh, these call for action. And we notify me we're you know we're in this business. So we notify our operators, our client, go, hey, you're going to see some increased flows. We didn't know what we were going to see, but we were running about an average of 800,000 gallons into our treatment plant. We went up to 1.6 million of that little event. So a lot of water was being flushed. But the, the difficult thing that we were having was getting that chlorine out because I think the fear factor was our water is contaminated. I don't want to use it. I'm not going to drink with it. I'm not going to shower with it. And so the water use has really went down during this time. So that was kind of hurting us as well. We needed water use to be up. We needed to get that chlorine out so we could get samples going and get two rounds of these samples clear so we could get more water advisory lifted for the ma major portion of our system and still work on that isolated area. During that process, in the second round of sampling, we were this close to getting that oil water order issued and we had a cold form hit clear down around the lake in Greenwood Bay. We're like, what in the world is going on here? Because um, you know, we had no other samples between where this isolated area is in Greenwood Bay, and we were certain that it was a false positive. You can't prove that without additional sampling. So, we talked to Department of Health and um, and said, well, you know, they said, well, you have to reset the clock. You need to be total, you know, total bacteria free, even though coliform is not a Coliform samples do not dictate boil water orders. They don't require boil water orders. Even if we were to find one in our system today, it just requires flushing and resample. So we resampled that residence. We strongly believe that it was a false positive. So we collected two samples from that residence, collected a sample upstream and downstream from it, sampled all of our sources, and did a representative sample across the district. Those samples all come back clean, and we changed nothing operationally. So we knew it was a false positive. I tried to convince the Department of Health of that so we could lift that boil water advisory um, a day earlier than we did. And they said, well, no, you're already geared up already to do one more round. So we ended up doing four rounds of clear samples from my mind because that was a false positive. We did four rounds of clear samples and lifted the advisory within what we said we were gonna do the one week time frame. Um, the isolated area that we had in the commercial development was one day lag behind, so we did that on Thanksgiving morning. Um, we issued door knockers to all of the businesses so when they came to work on Friday that they would know that their boil water had been lifted. Burning question in everybody's mind, what caused this, what happened? Um, and you know, and Bill can attest to this, we've been talking for Liberty Lake for a while about backflow programs. Um, and hydrant locks. And I think hydrant locks is something that really opened our eyes with uh, City of Spokane's experience with a hydro seed truck that um, put hydro seed into their drinking water. Um, and, you know, that doesn't require a boil water order. You just can't use it because you have hydro seed coming out of your faucets. And so um, we were a little bit fortunate because water, people still have water. They just had to boil for a minute, right? And so at least we didn't have the hydro seed. But it really opened all the purveyors' eyes to we need to lock our hydrants because our hydrants are the biggest risk. They are open. Anybody with a hydrant, uh, hydrant uh, wrench can operate one. Um, and from a uh, protection standpoint from Homeland Security, that's the big issue. So we had already budgeted for 2020 hydrant locks. We would already planned on that. So that's going to happen. I can tell you that. <laughs> They've already been ordered ahead of our budget. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> so, that, so that's one thing we're doing. The other thing that we had talked about for the uh, last several months with our board and is the backflow program and implementing a backflow program. We've advertised this in our newsletter. We talked about backflow in our newsletter. Um, we are planning on budgeting in 2020 a full time operator that I'm going to promote into a cross connection control specialist to run our backflow program. These backflow programs are pretty widely known in most water districts. Um, 
where in Idaho, for instance, there I was on a board of a irrigation district, and you know they have to be they have to be inspected every year. That cost to a customer was anywhere from forty to seventy dollars. And if you don't have one, you have to pay a couple hundred bucks to have them installed. So do those go over real well with the customers when you tell them suddenly you have to have your sprinkler system backflow device tested annually? You have to send a report to us annually, and if you don't have one, incidentally, you have to install it. No, they don't go over it very well, but that was something we had already teed up and get ready to do anyway. So is that program going to happen? Yes, it's going to happen both residential and commercial. Um, and I think the silver lining in this boil water issue that we have is really going to help us convey that message to the customers. Let's say, remember the great boil water from 2019 when you almost didn't have water for Thanksgiving? That's why we're doing this backflow program. Um, so where do we think it came from? We think it came from three potential areas. We either have a cross-connection issue with one of our um, commercial our customers. That's a possibility. Um, we either have um, a inadequate backflow device um, from sprinkler blowouts. Um, that's a real possibility or an illicit connection to our hydrant. Um, those are the only three options and ways that that could, have been, that could have been introduced. And I want you to think about how simple E. coli is to get into a water system. Just setting up a hypothetical scenario. Your landscape company, okay, you have hoses that are in the back of your truck and you're going to blow out sprinkler systems. And these hoses, you have mice that get two little, one or two little mouse droppings in your hose. Hook that hose up, backflow device is either not in place or not functioning, and you overcome the system pressure, you have E. coli. That simple. It's that easy. Um, when we're a non coordinated system, it's a big risk. So we're going to take pre aggressive measures. We're probably not going to be very popular with our customers, but we're going to remind them about why we're doing what we're doing and um, the importance of it. And we were there, we were, we were there, we were this close, we already had these things in motion. It's just this, I think, I'm kind of glad, I'm glad it happened, honestly, it was a lot of work, but there's a lot of benefits that we provided from it. Um, I think some of those benefits were, you know, us recognizing, we talk about how these emergencies play out, we talk about them all the time. What are we gonna do if we ever have a main line break in the middle of uh, Little Lake Road and Country Vista. You know, we talked about how we're going to respond to those scenarios. We talked about how we're going to respond to a boil water work. But, you know, real life situation, the manager's on vacation in Boise and has to drive up. Um, you know, I'm not there. To, that's a real life situation, right? We have other operators that are on vacation. We have people that have worked for, you know, beach and lake cleanup and worked for, you know, since November 3rd. Um, and so you like you have all these scenarios that you can never really reenact um, until you're deeply ingrained in them. And I think we learned a lot of lessons about how we respond. Um, and that first that first day was the biggest in on the 20th when we issued the boil water order and we had that mishap with the Department of Health. Um, and so people got notification there. The conspiracy theory started to run pretty deep about why are you not notifying us? I'm like playing on it. And then you know, I'm driving back to Boise. I had stopped a couple times and have conference calls. You know, and I ended up getting home at like midnight that night. You know, it's just like all these things were going on, and you know, we were unable to get. We were really focused and hyper focused on protecting the water system and protecting the customers um, from a public health standpoint. That we were pretty much radio silent on social media and stuff that first day. And well, we got a little backlash from that, but not because we didn't care about what the community wanted to know about what was going on is that we had a bigger fish to fry at that moment. We have a very small staff, some of us are out of town, and we really drove hard on what do we need to do to get this area isolated, what do we need to do to protect public health and get our water system in order. And so I think we recovered from that, but we did learn a lot of lessons. We learned some lessons about talking points that we have amongst our own staff. Um, but I think we've, we've solidified a lot of bonds that we have about um, emergency management and and sending out messages. I mean, the messages that we worked on with the city and with, with Mr. Brickner and getting, you know, water to the people, I think, you know, all those were very positive outcomes that we had. Um, and the other positive outcome is that 
not a lot of people realize that we're separate from the city of Liberty Lake. And so I think they realize now that we're separate from the city of Liberty Lake. And, you know, so I that's positive, right? There's lots of positives we can take out. And uh, I hope, you know, we've been, uh, we were established in 1973, and this is the one and only time this has happened to us. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's, it's a great learning lesson. I think uh, we're going to definitely talk to other water purveyors about, you know, what you can do in this kind of event. But I'll be happy to take any questions. And we'll all come out there. Thank you. Oh, yeah, Sam, of course. Can you elaborate on the two homes where it was first detected? How did that come about? Did they, did they notice something? Because why I ask that question is I haven't asked that question. Sure. From some citizens. Yeah, so the two homes were on North Rocky Hill Lane, like way out, like um, on the other side of like First Liberty Apartments, there's that little private driveway up there. Oh, really? Yeah, so those are the two homes. Um, they're serviced off an eight inch water main, two homes. So not a lot of water flow. Um, that's the part, you know, that's AWWA standards for the water main, you have to be eight inches. Go up to a hydrant and then there's two individual services that take off of one of those from where that hydrant is. So that hydrant is at the very end of our system. And from the end of that main where that hydrant is, those two individual services come off. And one of those services was a new connect, relatively new connection that we um, had permitted. Um, and they, when they first connected to our system, they got all, they met all of our standards, had clear back T samples and stuff. The issues that they were having were related to pressure. So we have adequate pressure provided to that hydrant at the end of that system. But from their service line, it climbs way up on the hill, and they end up having pressure issues. So they wanted to install like a inline booster pump. So they had opened that line, they had installed a cistern, and we required them to do backflow devices like we would on any other type of connection like that. Um, but they had opened that line to put in a um, inline booster pump, and we think that you know, that line had been opened by them a number of times. We weren't instituting any of this work or involved in any of it. Um, and so what we what we needed to do is continue to sample. They needed to sample and verify that they were getting clean samples up there. They contracted oh, okay. on. They contracted with the lab directly. In fact, we weren't even knowledgeable about any of the sample results that they were getting because it was not part of our system. It's on a private water line at that point. Um, and so then when they reached out to us and said, "Hey, we're not able to get good clear samples here. Can you help us out?" Sure. Like. We think it, you know, can you sample the hydrant to make sure that the water that you're that coming out of the hydrant into the service line is, is satisfactory? Sure. So that's how that started. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, a couple things. Um, when we talk about total coal farm, there's a difference, and people make assumptions at times, as you said. Um, total coal farm is based on soil and plants. Um, fecal is the other type of coal farm, which is more be a coli based form. So I think it's important that people understand that that secondary test came back as total with more soil based, plant based. Yeah, it's it's really environment. Right, environment. Really out of environment. And when we find total coal farm, and what we have on limited and rare occasions actually, we find total coal farm, all it requires from the Department of Health standpoint is re flush and resample. Yeah. And often that cleans it up because it is environment. And you can those total coal form samples, similarly to an E. coli sample, can easily be contaminated as, as easy as uh, yeah. over the bottom. I mean, because it's so, you know, dust particles, things like that get in there and cause it. Dirt is the biggest, uh, probably the biggest contributor to total coal form. Um, like we, we do a new construct, new mainline construction, for instance. We have to get clean bacteria samples, clean bacteria samples, um, and total coal form is always present initially until they get that you know, flushed out of the new, new system or out of that new portion of the line because it's got dirt and exposed to the environment. So yeah, yeah, very good point. And this was a, a great, as Baji said, this is a great learning opportunity for your department as well as the city, uh, from the staff to the citizens. And there's a lot of things to learn. And you know, a lot of things we're gonna continue to assess in 2020 moving forward and working together uh, to make sure that we're communicating as much as possible and I appreciate all the work that you and your team did so thank you for that but I also want to thank the city staff here in the office
Dallas, Jen, the rest of the city staff really stepped up to make sure that the citizens got water, as well as the library staff and the Liberty Lake Fire Department as well, and the Liberty Lake Police Department for that matter, because they helped unload water to some of these different areas. And everybody really kind of stepped up for the most part to uh, make sure the citizens had good, clean water. So thank you. Yeah, and I we really appreciate from the bottom of our hearts everybody's help and support during this process because it um, can't do it alone. And I think, you know, many hands make a light load, and this community is very supportive of the efforts of these two agencies. And so you know, I commend, I commend you on, um, on both your support and I really appreciate that. And I want to mention that we put a call out for volunteers. There were several calls from elderly and disabled that couldn't carry water, couldn't come get water, and that was very successful. So thank you to this community on that. Absolutely. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Any questions, you know where to find me. Give me a call. I'm happy to take the call anytime. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, fire department's out here, right? Uh, I think we're done with that. And then the city council reports. Nothing here. We're moving on to the administrator. Okay. Okay. Let's see here. So, good evening, Mayor, members of the council. I have a uh, kind of a longer report, but I'll talk pretty fast. Um, I wanted to cover with you the high points of the transition plan. Um, I do have a date for the orientation for our new council members. It is October 17th from 1 to 2 30. December. Excuse me. October. I moved down October to December. Uh, 17th from 1 to 2 30. That's an opportunity for uh, our directors to meet with our new uh, two new council members. Um, They'll be taking office after the first of the year and give them an orientation on uh, what, what goes on in the city, how the agenda package gets put together, et cetera. Uh, then December 23rd through December 31st, um, if you are newly elected, we're asking that you contact Ann Swenson so she can informally swear you in so that you can officially be a, um, have your office start January. Then on January 7th, we'll have a ceremonial swearing in for our newly elected. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that the judge that has done it before is retired, so we are looking for a new person. We, have, uh, we don't have a name, but I'm sure we'll find someone. So moving along, I wanted to recognize Councilmember Mike Kennedy, who has received an advanced cert certification of the leadership. So That's congratulations. Fast. Did you receive the certificate yet? I think I might have just got it in my box. Okay, congratulations. Well, it was just either that or termination of it. Sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and then also, at the end of the year, we are very fortunate in our community to have waste management make a donation of three thousand dollars to our local nonprofits. And so today, um, Tammy Yeager and your assistant Tammy Hagerty are here. And did you want to say a few words, Tammy? If you don't want to, that's fine, but I can. <laughs> she, uh, as she walks up to the podium, I'll just mention, um, because of logistics, they actually got a check to Rotary, and then Rotary distributes eight checks equally amongst um, eight nonprofits in our, in our community. So I would just like to thank um, staff and council for deliberating and deciding. I know this is not a huge amount of money, but Working for other nonprofits, I know that every little bit counts, and uh, it's pretty awesome to see that going back into our local community. And uh, so, both Tammy and I both spelled the same line, um, <laughs> live in Liberty Lake, so it's fun for us to be here tonight and appreciate all of the recipients and all the work that they do as well. And uh, thank you to the staff who are so awesome to work with. So. Thank you very much. back on the end of those organizations. So it's Friends of Pavilion Park, Rotary Lions, Moanas, Fallen Heroes, The Hub, Friends of the Library, and the Spokane Valley Chamber Foundation. So those are the recipients of three hundred and seventy five dollars. So well, Holly, I don't know if you knew that. But I did not. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so now I'm on number four, Harvard and Henry Road projects. Um, we do have some good news, so bear with me through the uh, beginning part. 
As all of you are aware, either by reading the newspaper or by going to the webinar, um, the court did stay initiative 976 to create a pause for the court to evaluate its constitutionality. So um, probably just bought some time, but the initiative was supposed to go into effect December 5th. There are some communities, we are not aware of them, that collect um, in, or collect fees from that initiative that were going to be going away. And so the, those, um, anyway, we're not one of that group, but the initiative has been stayed and it is, will not go into effect December 5th. The other thing I want to mention is Washdog has put out a deferral list, and on the deferral list it includes our Henry Road project. It's not called Henry Road, it's called Interstate 90 Harbor to Harbor, local roads. So that's Henry. It, it did defer Harvard, the westbound on ramp, and it also deferred the dash ramp that we got. So all of that has been deferred. Um, we don't know how long it's going to take for there to be a resolution, but um, I did call Washdown, I did talk to them, and unless a contract had been executed, then everything was placed on hold, which is what's happened in our situation. Um, on the appraisal status, we did receive the first appraisal. The second appraisal is underway. He's going to he call me Monday to tell me he was going to call me next Monday, so it's not complete. I don't have it. Um, but Strong Spikes are still working on that. I do have some movement on the washdog contract. Um, this afternoon we received a rewrite. They basically took the contract that we had, and if I could just uh, take a side step here. They took a template contract originally, and then they started piling on things that made the R. Henry Road arrangement with them unique. So it got to be a pretty um, complicated contract. So Larry Larson sent to me today the rewrite by the Attorney's General's Office. We just got it, we're just reviewing it, and it's, it's a slimmed down version of what we already had. There is no substantial changes to any of the terms and conditions, so it's pretty much the same thing, though the verbiage is different. I'm gonna wait until we complete all of our staff review and iron out um, any areas of concern before we provide it to you, but I'm hoping that we are, well, we are hoping to get on the agenda for December 17th. So as soon as we work out the internal review, we'll, we'll give you guys a review. But like I said, but I reviewed it, RJ, did you have a chance to look it over? I've gone over it once, I've got you. Okay. Yeah. So RJ's reviewing it, it's hot, and, and Lisa's reviewing it, and our attorney's out till next week, so we're all reviewing it, and we'll give it to you well in advance of January 17th. December 17th, right? Um, so that's good news. And then the design contract status, um, as you know, Lochner was selected as our preferred design consultant. Scott is negotiating that. If the washout contract comes together on the 17th of December, then Lochner's contract would be on the same agenda I'm looking at Lisa. So we're shooting to package those both in our next possibility. So the design effort will continue. Now, I've said this before, and I just wanted to, um, if council has any questions or concerns, let me know. But what we wanted to do at a strategic level is keep the Henry Road design moving forward. It was always going to be paid for by us when it goes through the tip and left. And by having a project, it's probably a good nine month design, maybe even a little bit longer. But having that document done and complete is, makes it much more attractive for funding. So um, the, the design does have a shelf life. It doesn't, have, it doesn't last forever, but it'll be good for several years while we pursue funding if something happens for the initiative at 76. So that's kind of a recap of all those things. So if you have concerns about moving forward, um, just let us know. But that's our, our goal right now. So with that, I'm going to go on to the TIP grant. Uh, we, we submitted two applications and we received funding for both. So Liberty Lake Road mm -hmm. Overlay, that's basically from Chevron down to Sprague. We've driven that road, it's been, there's numerous um, spot repairs here and there. So this will be a, a grind and overlay, um, probably as a spring or summer. And then Country Vista um, at the Ridgeline High School, the traffic signal received funding as well. And just uh, for those of you that are interested, um, the funding we received it totals about eight hundred seventy-five thousand dollars total, and the total cost project cost is about one point two million dollars. 
So the amount of dollars that we would be contributing to these two projects was about three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. That's the difference. The other thing I want to just remind council of when we did Apple Way, the two signals on Apple Way, the Liberty Lake Road, the overlay on Mission, the overlay on Valley Way, all of that was funded by TMP. So we have, and, and actually on Sutler as well, we have used this funding source a lot to do almost all of our capital for so it's really we've been successful and we always um, balance the match with our our utility uh, tax dollars um, just curious I uh, the readings didn't apply all of the readings in the article about 976 it's unclear to me whether or not CID will be affected by so, any of that so I don't think so but RJ is going to he's more up to, up to date on that and then also did you mention governor and police budget Sure. Um, so TIB is funded primarily from the gas tax. So if they don't receive their funding from this source, so I believe that's not on the table for legislation to look at. Legislation, when the legislature's come into session, it's a short session. Um, in January, they'll be looking at the governor's proposed budget, which should come out in the next seven to 10 days. So that'll give them kind of a hint, or at least, uh, what the governor's proposing and the legislature could be working on that. So it'll be projects that were funded from I-976 that they'll be looking to projects that were funded from other sources and the TIB is not included into that. Right, so yeah, I guess that was my concern is that I know it comes from the gas tax, but whether or not that is subject to being rated for some of these other projects that the particular we have a world that has been great. Okay. okay, so um that's Good news, I think. And then also, Anita's going to give us an update on recording council meetings. Um, we know, we, like I said, we've done a lot of research. We've changed the numbers around because we ended up going with a different vendor, and we selected this vendor a little over a month ago. So thank you. OK, so um, at the last council meeting, you had asked for some numbers on um, the vote cast, and we also have closed captioning. So I just wanted to kind of give you a breakdown of that 30,000. Um, 845 um, dollar fee that we had um, associated with that. Um, the um, the one-time fees include the boat cast and the closed captioning, which is four thousand six hundred forty dollars of that. There's the annual fees of, of the first years up front, which is sixteen thousand four hundred sixty-eight dollars. The exclusive I mean, total hardware and the setup that we need to run it with Freaticus is $4,500, and then the upgrade of our system that's already here um, of audio and recording equipment is $5,237, which comes to that total of $30,845. And, and part of the uh, capital budget is the five-year replacement of any equipment that we need. You know, on the operating budget side, there will be an annual fee of $16,468, uh, just so you're aware of that. Um, the, the purpose of us going with Granicus is because it's a much more established company. Um, some of you might have heard of Granicus before, it's been around for years. It's a known product. We were able to find other um, municipalities that were using it with good results. Whereas the other company that we looked at had just merged um, with another company in 2017. They had a great product, but we just weren't that comfortable with them because they were starting to build instead of already have a finished product that worked. So that's why we decided to go this route. So um, the installation, including any equipment and software, we're looking at having it um, done by the, at the earliest in March of 2020. Any questions? If it's approved, by the way, I should add that thought. <laughs> sure. I, I, you, you, you might have touched on this, and I, I might have missed it. Is it that includes a software so we can record our votes? That yes, it does. Okay, yes, is that a lighted one? Excuse me. Is that one of these sophisticated lighted? Lighted. It will be actually um, on the screen, and, and um, um, Anne is able to record it as part of the minutes, and it will be recorded as part of the video also. And what is the cost for that? That's included in the uh, original, the initial fees that I said, the one-time fees. Okay, four thousand. So when you vote, as I understand, when you vote, your names will be up on the board, and it will agree in the yes vote granting the vote. And if it's unanimous, it will just be unanimous. It, it won't be a fight. Any other question? 
Saturday with Santa, Jocelyn already mentioned this on December 14th. Please make an appointment to get um, lined up, and it's from 10 30 to 1 30 in the afternoon. Then, City Hall and Library will be closed on December 25th and January 1st. And then, finally, Winter Glow will conclude on January 1st. So, if you haven't had a chance to see it or want to see it again, uh, it is, uh, I think it's on all night. So, yes. <laughs> yes. That concludes my report. Kate, Kate, would you go back on the Harvard Ender Road project? Yes. I noticed on December 17th we have approved agreement for engineering services for Ender Road. Road. Is that the design? Is that what we're talking about? There? Could you read that one more time? It says approved agreement for engineering services for Ender Road for December 17th. That is for the design project. I would, I would like to say that I think what we need to have is a discussion of the council. This is so we, need, we really know what we're looking at and moving forward with we're going to get into the design phase of Henry Road. Seeing South, we're not sure of the outcome of 976. So, so you had mentioned that the council has any concerns or questions that bring it up, but I think that for, I would recommend we have a discussion on that. Obviously, we have to have a separate meeting for that, but maybe on the 17th to have that discussion. So on the design, um, boy. Um, so is it a, is your question a workshop on the design content of the project? How we move forward. Um, so so I can take a stand at it right now if you want. No, 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 it's well, excuse me. It's council's pleasure. You want to deal with it now or give some thoughts to that and have it on the 17th? I guess Mike had asked to be direct. Are you wanting to not proceed with design in the project? No, I want to discuss. Okay. Ramifications positive and not that do we move forward to something like that? Because we still don't know we're gonna go to 20.9. We know we're gonna kick in up to six million dollars. But to look at do we move forward with a design and what's the shelf life of that design? That was I think the legitimate questions we need to look at. I concur with you, Mike. I believe that we do need to look at it. I don't think it's necessary that we need a workshop, but at some point we need to set something aside some time in the agenda just to give around some ideas. Bottom line for me is always that I want Henry Road, <laughs> I want Harvard Road taken care of. You know, if it comes down to priorities between the two, if we get into a situation where we're not going to get our 20.9, I think the council we seriously have to look at what are our priorities. So, so let me make sure I understand just to put everything to simplify so I understand. Um, so Scott is negotiating a contract, a design contract with a firm, and the question is, do we want to move forward or not? Does the council want to move forward with the design effort? And what are the risks associated with it? Um, and we can bring back that information. Um, I would just say this for something for the council to ponder is the shelf life of a design is probably, you know, it's going to be a good probably five to ten years, so there is there is value to that. The, the design phase of this work is probably all of nine to twelve months. That's how long it's going to take to complete that effort. And let's see, what else would I say? The technical aspect of it, so geotechnical, structural, all of those um, things that are required by the design consultant, all have to be reviewed by the wash job. And then the last thing I want you to uh, consider is that this, the dollars that would be spent on that is probably in that, I'm trying to remember, they said eight to nine hundred thousand dollars is the design contract, somewhere in there, in that order of magnitude. If we spend that money, then it is reimbursable from tip and lift, whether the project moves forward sooner or later. And that if I initiative 976 is funded, then it's a, it will always be a credit towards the six million, or it can be used as a credit towards a match for another funding source. 
So that's just something to think about. That's all valuable information. That's why I think that what you're sharing with us now is certainly discussed that on the 17th. So we're all in one mind and we move forward on, on this. Okay. If it appears that the 17th is loaded, you can move back to the next one. There's no, you know, I haven't seen a compelling reason that it has to be done by or before the end of the year. Okay. Uh, consent agenda. Remove consent agenda one and two to approve November 12th, 2019, November 19th, 2019, and November 22nd, 2019 city council minutes, and to approve December 3rd, 2019 vouchers in the amount of $422,211.92. Second. Consent for the discussion. I hear you're all in favor Move general business number one to approve renewal of annual support agreement with Bias Software in the amount of nine thousand six hundred sixty-seven dollars and seventy-five cents. Second. And the second for the discussion. I hear you all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. There you go. And then under right. well under general business, we also have the approval of the one thousand dollar donation from Spokane Teachers Credit Union to the library. Second. And the second for further discussion. Are you hearing any comments? Yes. Oh, here. Lisa. Yes. Um, quickly, um, we, 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 we talked about this at, at, at a couple of council meetings, and um, we have some new information based upon workshops um, as well as. Is it on? I don't, I don't think so. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. So, uh, um, just a couple things that I wanted to point out. Um, yes. Yeah, there we go. So, um, uh, staff has recommended a couple amendments at our workshop. The um, one of the council members, I believe it was Council Member Moore, but I'm not positive about that brought up the fact that they wanted Rocky Hill Splash Pad project number six removed from the from the list because the because of the issues that we have had with uh, splash pads, etc. Um that wasn't was the, uh, Okay, I'm sorry. It, that was um that was uh not in the form of a motion and and again so if the council would like to remove Rocky Hill splash pad from the list. It's right now on the list as a project, but it's not funded in any of the years within it. Um, uh, you could delete it from the project list and delete it from the project descriptions on page one um, uh, with a motion. Uh, the second staff recommended amendment really is dealing with the uh, uh, council Chambers recording hardware, and there's three different amendments that you need to make to this, um, and based upon the fact that we're switching to Granicus. So you need to reduce the total cost for all years from 40950 to 38345 number one. Number two, you're going to increase the 2020 amount from 25950 to 30,845, as, as Anita had explained. The third thing that you're going to need to do is reduce the 2025 amount, this is for the replacement equipment, uh, from 15,000 to 7,500. So those are the three changes. We'll have a slide up when you're, when, when you're um, acting on it, but I did want to lay out for you what, exactly what those changes were. Uh, the third staff recommended amendment, um, and, and let me just point out project number 19, um, when you change that, you'll also have to make an amendment to the budget, okay? But project A17, the Kubota, the Kubota RTB with Cloud Lane, um, there was a disconnect and we had done several amendments, and this was my bad. Um, in that it did end up move, it, it, at one point it moved to 2023, but then it moved back to 2020. And I did not catch this in there. It's actually in the budget for 2020, 
but you will need to make this amendment on the capital facilities plan also to remove that $28,000 from 2023 back to 2020. So those are the three staff recommended uh, amendments. And, and again, the first one is based upon the council workshop. I just did want to point out that, that um, if you wanted to make that amendment, that it would be on the form of a motion. And obviously, any other changes you have. The public hearing point is really not for me to talk so much as to give the public an opportunity to share their thoughts. But I did want to tee this up for you in terms of the amendments. Well, so that they have a, as I was saying, the first page as a If Yes. So, it's, well, the, we, you have the first read tonight, but, but, but we can make the amendments for the second read. So, um, you would have a, so, you, so you have a clean copy. Um, for the actual adoption, um, along with any other amendments you choose to make this evening. So, I mean, I would like to kind of get it done. So, Rocky Hill, despite that, I think what we talked about at the workshop was about, you know, kind of the difficulty we had at Orchard Park. Yes, that's correct. You know, with the, you know, the water and how you get the permitting and so forth. So, I mean, we talked about that. And therefore, it was delayed. It. Mm -hmm. I think that's what was the conversation. That's what happened. that's what happened in the last year's right. uh capital so you right. wanna just because we have difficulty in working with the district, but maybe in the future, in twenty twenty five or twenty three, twenty twenty three, whatever, uh the ability to expedite the um, permitting of the splash pad It'd be easier to get one there. I don't know. It's, it's, those are my thoughts. I, I, guess, I guess my my thought would be, you know, we already have it on the list. I know we've had some difficulties, but we don't have any funding on it. So is there any harm in leaving it on there? With no, them? it's it, it's a great placeholder if it's something that you think that you'd like to do in the future. We, I will also say that last year, if we had an unrealistic dollar amount associated with it this year, we actually have a much more accurate um, assessments. I, I, the the thought would be that it would be about one hundred eighty thousand um, at the time that we did it. So so just just based upon kind of a prorated version of what we did for Orchard Park. So I see I see that plan as kind of a bit more on a wish list, and then once we put funding to it, that becomes mm -hmm. exactly. My really favorite leaving that on there for the simple reason it's not funded, and I think there's nothing wrong with leaving that there for future discussion. I, I would be in favor of leaving it on the, on the list. I also think you should go ahead. Okay. Any other questions? Better, should we just take these as a motion? Well, this is the public, so this is the public hearing portion of it, so I would think well, I understand that you're it. just taking testimony, but you could make motions at the, as part of the first read, correct? My goal was to try to get it on there for the public so they know that these are some of the things that we're thinking about. You can do that. Yeah, that's so. <laughs> You know, but you have to do it sometime. Yes. Sir. Is there a motion for all three of those? Two, uh, two uh, specifically, the amendment project 19 and project 8-17. Has staff, staff recommended? Second. In the second. Further discussion? Okay, I'm going to say aye. Aye. Uh, and number six is already on there, so we're not taking it off, right? Perfect. Thank you. So now we're at the public hearing. As of in. So this is the public hearing is open at uh, 8.07. And I would love to hear any of your comments on capital facilities plan, which includes a lot of stuff. Bill. Just one small comment <clears throat> for Kubota RTV's problem, problem with the lead. So <clears throat> is it possible to put rubber on that lead so we don't break the steel that we have in the streets? Just a minute. It's a trail. It's a trail. It's a trail. Well, this is not part of your plowing. 
Trevor Montgomery. Did I steal one? We do have it in the streets. Yeah. <laughs> Any other comments? <laughs> That's an awesome Catholic facilities plan. So, close the public hearing in 809. And we're on the resolutions in 1326. Resolution number 19 260, City of Liberty Lakes, Booking County, Washington. A resolution of the City of Liberty Lake, Washington of mandate planning and building services and public works be scheduled to reflect revisions necessary to recover city costs to take effect January 1, 2020. Move resolution 19-260. Second. Second. Further discussion? I just want to say thanks for all of our work on the staff on this. Um, I think it has been a lot of time and effort in getting the comparatives and seeing what everybody else does. And, um, I appreciate all the time, which we've done before. Great job. Any other comments? Can I hear any all in favor of resolution number 19260? Raise your right hand. I count seven out of seven. Is that correct? It's adopted. Uh, resolution 19261 M. Resolution number 19-261, City of Liberty Lake, Spokane County, Washington. A resolution of the City of Liberty Lake, Washington, declaring the intent of the City of Liberty Lake to adopt legislation to authorize a sales and use tax for affordable and supportive housing in accordance with Substitute House Bill 1406, Chapter 338, Laws of 2019, and other matters related thereto. Resolution 19-261. Second. Second. Vote and second. Discussion? I hear you all in favor, raise your right hand. Seven seven. It's adopted. <coughs> resolution 19-262, and Resolution number 19-262, City of Liberty Lake, Spokane County, Washington. A resolution of the City of Liberty Lake, Washington, approving the final plat of Trutina, third edition, located in portions of Government Lots 6 and 7, Section 10, Township 25N, Range 45E, WM, Liberty Lake, Washington, File 2015.PL0001B. <laughs> Yes, um, I apologize for the legal description, but it is what it is. <laughs> um, so just quickly, so um, Trutina Preliminary Plat approval was done back in July of 2015. Um, it involved 137 uh, acres and change and proposed to create 400 lots, 363 of which were single family residential, 37 uh, of which were commercial multifamily. Um, along with multiple tracks and private streets. Um, so Trutina 3rd edition this is actually the fourth edition, the first one being just the edition. Um, involves 7.83 acres, 35 single family lots, uh, one track and private streets. Um, where we are at with this um, uh, basically is that there's still 90, almost 91 acres remaining unplanned within Trutina, um, including 223 single family lots and 35 commercial and multifamily lots. So it is, um, um, again, it's, it's building out slowly but surely. It's probably another three, four, five years, depending upon the market, um, before it gets fully built out. But this is the next phase of it. So um, do you have any questions? Of the remaining uh, build up, has any of it been designated for green space that in the municipal? Um, yes, there are some. There, there is some green space, space and tracks uh, within it. Um, again, um, there are portions that have not yet been developed along um, the term that they uh, developed. There is. Um, wildlife mitigation area that has to be um, that has to be landscaped and whatnot. There's also more along the river that needs to be um, that, that needs to be included. But it's not I, it, there's not any um, 
large like park area, if you will, but there are trails and there are various open space. Other comments? Bob? Yes, what is the uh, overall plan density, the theoretical density of the development? I'm sorry, I don't have my calculator in. <laughs> so I, I think it's uh, out of the, uh, again, part of it is that they've got 37 lots of this, which could be either multifamily or commercial. I think the intent is more commercial than multifamily, but again, they're, they're, that's going to be driven by the, by the market. Um, uh, it's consistent with the um, with the specific area plan, and again, this is I think this was uh, when we go back um, the original. It was originally approved for 400 lots on 137 acres. So uh, even assuming that all of those were single family residential, it's um, uh, you, you'd be doing less than four units per acre, so it's not it, it's not super dense. Very good, thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, 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 Move resolution nineteen dash two sixty. Second. Second. Further discussion. Hearing all in favor, raise your hand. Seven seven seven. First read ordinance is Anne. Ordinance number 264, City of Liberty Lakes, Washington County of Washington. An ordinance of the City of Liberty Lake, Washington, adopting a budget for the period January 1, 2020 through December 31, 2020, appropriating funds and establishing salary schedules for established positions. So um, what I handed out is the latest staff or latest changes to the budget. They haven't really sh they haven't changed from what's already in the packet. Uh, what I wanted to discuss was if there's anything that can be added or questions. Because we did uh, we do have some uh, three staff recommended updates to the budget. Um, one is related to the share PSP EMS agreement. So we got that um, their fee proposal in November. Uh, so we had budget originally 180, it's actually 204. This is based on the experience ratios they had from a year or so ago, and then they amend the budget to include those costs going into next year. So we tried, they're increasing rapidly, but um, we, uh, according to the agreement, we were under funded in that line item. Um, you see the council chamber hardware is in there, and that was also discussed tonight, going from 25, 950 to 30. Uh, $30,000 five. Um, and then the number five is on the appropriation of the lodging tax dollars. Um, when we did the original forecast that we put this budget together back in September, at that time the revenue forecast only had was only was only really for half a year. Now that yeah, we have three months more of numbers, I feel more confident that there's actually more um, more funds available to appropriate. So $62,000 of recommendation that ties into what was recommended um, uh, for the lodging tax uh, uh, advisory group uh, last week, and that, that will come to you on the 17th. Um, Item number two on here, the transfer to public art fund. Uh, we are asking, um, need to make sure of clarity that we have that one right. So the budget shows a transfer originally of 61.5. Council said, uh, suggests that down to 35,000. Um, but I want to make sure that whole, it, it, it has a net effect. So the public, uh, the parks and arts has a separate fund. So we move transfer money from 2019 what was appropriated for, through the budget into that fund now not all the projects got done in that fund so there's a balance of about seventeen thousand dollars left some of that's going to go to the mural project of the building park because that did not get done 19 so carrying over to 2020. so question becomes is the intention of the council that they only have thirty five thousand dollars worth of appropriations period for 2020 or is it the amount that they have in cash right now is plus the 35. Mike. Mike, as a matter of that it's been my understanding all along it's thirty five thousand. 
Okay. But that's 2020. 2020. But that would also include the projects they hadn't finished in 19 as well. So just 35 million. 35 million. Chris? Um, so, I think mean, thanks for clarifying, Mark. There is $17,000 in that separate fund that's already been put in there that they were intending to spend this year that didn't get really that chance to, basically, correct? Correct. And then another 35000 for 2020. 20. And so, to me, I, I like my expectation, sort of like our, um, our building emergency contingency fund, right? You, put, you try to keep it funded at a certain level. Um, so, so, to me, I would, um, as we come up with it a little bit too, um, I would have expected them to spend that 35000 last year, 35000 2020. And, going forward. So in my mind, it would be to put the two together. Uh, here, uh, I don't know the exact same thing as Councilman Pinesca, I would hope that it would stack on top of each other each year. And part of that hope would be so that the Parks and Arts Commission gets the opportunity to be, to be good stewards of that money year over year. So 17K would stack on top of the 35K coming in the next year, and then they find additional Grants, wherever they find their money from, from donations, they can continue to add on that year over year. And they want to save up for something. They want to save up for something. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. But it'd be my intention that the 35 would have on top of the second. I agree with uh, Councilor Spearson. Um, uh, I agree with uh, Councilman Seward also. I think it should be the 17,000 plus the 35. You know, when we establish the uh, the fund last year, the budget at, at thirty five thousand dollars. They had no idea exactly how it was going to work, and I don't think they did either. And, uh, I don't think that, that they necessarily have to spend the money that they have, but since it was budgeted to them and allocated to them, I think they should have the opportunity to utilize it. Yes, any? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mayor. This is the city budget, budgeted item. Their fund comes out of the city, is that correct? Is that the funding source comes from the general, general fund? General fund? Yes. Where does it say anywhere that we voted on that if you don't spend it, you get to keep it? So the budget for 2019 said the transfer from general fund goes into the park term, which was 34500 from last year. That was their beginning balance. That's the money that moved over, yes. At what point did the council ever say and endorse and provide for a carryover annually? I think the definition of the fund setting it up and move money in there defines that. I disagree totally with what you were talking about. However, for sake of argument, do we have other funds? Do the police department get to save fifty thousand dollars a year? No, the police department doesn't have to save, but they're in the Does the park. does the city park? No, the city park is part of the general maintenance. Maintenance is part of the Why would why all of a sudden do you think the city council would approve something like because that? Because we established a separate fund for the parks and um, fund by yeah, But it came out of the general fund. Mm -hmm. Correct, but it said that. So anyway, my thought is is that there's you know I don't remember anything special about that point, okay? And I'm sure I voted for it, but if somebody told me at the time that by creation of this special fund out of our regular general account, that you're now saying, yeah, go ahead and spend, you know, what you don't see, save it, roll it. No, no. Because then you start doing something for a department that is not being done for the other departments. I just want us to think about that in itself as we contemplate fairness throughout our 2020 budgets. I would say the difference between the departments and this fund, this is a capital, we treat this as a capital fund, this is for specific projects. Thank you. The discussion, Mike? I always try to look for, for, for clarity and it brings me back to the confusion that I think we have with parks and art. Parks and art to me is an X number of dollars goes in there for everything in parks 
and the park. So if we're spending the X number of dollars on anything in the park, such as $17,000 for the opera, whatever the case may be, that's parks and art. It brings me back to the suggestion that I would like to see us as we move forward to set up a separate fund for art so we don't get into this confusion of, well, is this actually money for parks or is it for art or what is it? We could change this to just say art fund too. We could drop the parks portion of this because a lot of what the activity in here is art that goes into the park. Well, that has been my comfort level since day one of having funding for art. For some or another, it became parks and art. So I think at some point, I would like to recommend to the council to look at having a division there. So if they get donations and stuff that is specifically designed for art, that money has to be left totally for art and not gravitate into this confusion. Is, it, is this art money or is this art money? So it's, for me, it's, it's clarity. Christian, that makes sense because you know we look at the budget. Things that I would expect to be in a parks and arts fund, like fireworks, like the right. symphony, those things are still actually being paid out of the fund. They're not being paid out of the, the parks and arts capital. Some of the, the source of the revenue where the how to pay for these items are coming from. What we were establishing, like for the fireworks or for the of this the symphony, that is just something that the general fund, whether it be payroll tax, uh, property taxes, sales tax, one of those other funding sources to help support that. There's not a specific revenue source to say to pay for one certain thing. And that's uh, that's the, what this Parks and Arts Fund, what we designated saying, we're going to carve out a small portion from the general fund to move into this fund for the Parks and Arts Commission to determine what they're going to spend when it comes to capital related projects. And so a lot of art that they're doing has been functionally put into parks. Some of it has been on the, on the wrap boxes, which actually hasn't come out of that fund that's been done in the last six years. Uh, I think for clarification purposes, this would be a great conversation to have down the road, absolutely. So we'll be separating it uh, out for clarification uh, for everybody to understand exactly what's going on here. Uh, but I also do support the carryover. Any comments? So that was, thank you. That, I'm looking at Janet to make sure she got clarity on that. Um, any other questions on this? There you go. There you go. So first three orders, and City of Liberty Lakes, Buckingham County, Washington, ordinance number two. An ordinance of the City of Liberty Lake, Washington, adopting the 2020 through 2025 capital facility plan. Uh, ordinance number 265. Can get that? Oh, I All right, I'll come to the agenda. Okay. Sorry, excuse me. I thought we were still on on the discussion of 264 adopting city budget. Is it too late to address one item or two problems earlier? Is it if we look at the putting in the seven the seven crosswalks, the light to be hundred and forty thousand dollars or something like that. And I believe we only have budgeted how much? Sixty five. Fifty five thousand. Sixty five. I will my recommendation would be is that we change that in the budget for $140,000 to take care of the priority of those seven, because my assumption is that those seven will be done before any others. Because it's going to be 140, we have 50. Obviously, we're going to have to come back to the council for a budget adjustment. I think it'd be good if we did that right now. Uh, I think before we do that, I want to get some feedback from the staff with regards to the. Um, bandwidth of the staff to actually accomplishing the seven installments. I think if we can't do that, then we're not necessary to spend the money on it. So is that something we can look into? You know, keep, keep it on, that on the table and we can look into the staff. 
Right. right, another option is when RJ put together the spreadsheet of the adjustments, we can put the adjustment in there, but just do it knowing that there might be dollars that don't get spent in 2020 that might be spent in 2021. But you can also make a, a motion to amend the budget to be the hundred and some thousand. Okay. Yeah, so so a lot of times feedback is going on. Okay, well that yeah. Okay. Me, I think it would be premature to amend it at this time. And uh, you can always amend the budget later, even next year. And uh, it would just be premature to do it now. Okay. Other comments? Okay, so uh, bear with me as I read through these. We do have a number of presentation and awards to be given out to employees and uh, folks. Um, we do have a community needs assessment presentation by our consultant on the library's master plan. We do have a year approval for the lodging tax advisory board recommendation for distribution of those funds. We are looking to have a washed off contract here regarding the Harvard and Henry Road projects. Um, we'll be asking you to accept two TIB grants, one for the Signal on Country Vista, and the other is for the Overlay Project on Labor Lake Road. Um, we do have on the agenda confirming Parks and Arts Commissioners. We do have on the agenda a Resolution 12-164E related to, let's see here, um, capital improvements. These are, these are capital, facility, capital facilities plan. Excuse me, there's a lot of words that said that. Um, we have a second reading ordinance on the budget and a second reading ordinance on the capital facilities plan. And then what I didn't mention yet is the engineering service agreement and providing more information on um, moving forward or not with awarding that contract. Okay. That's it, Kate. Okay. So some comments. Oh, if I may, real quick. Um, Katie, I, I do see um, 121 um, workshop <coughs> council rules of procedure. Um, what I don't see on here, I think February be a better time, um, is the review of the logo ordinance that, that I kind of came up in a very short discussion a couple meetings ago. I don't see it on there for next year. I forgot the ordinance somewhere on that point. Yeah, Anne's writing it down right now. Thank you. Thanks again. Obviously, uh, Katie, what you read was uh, upcoming for December 17th. Correct. I don't see on here where am I missing it for the appointment of Parks and Art or. So, if you read the one that we updated it today, I'm sorry. So, you have the copy that went out Friday. So, we didn't get the didn't get copy. So, my um, apologies. There were some things that got moved around. So Anne updated the list, and we'll, we'll give you all a copy of the new list. So on here is what I just read, which includes the um, the Parks and Arts Commissioner appointments for the for the seventeenth of December. So the comments. Any comments? Oh, come on, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Just because I'm so old, I'll give you a little history on the TIB. So it was established in 1988. The reason I know that is because I was there. Um, so it was three cents of the gas tax. <clears throat> that doesn't sound like a lot of money. <laughs> but the idea was they would collect this money, be able to put bonds together, which creates even more money, and there was a board, an actual board that governed what projects went and what projects didn't. Now obviously since then there's been amendments to that original thing, but that was the establishment of TID and they kind of changed that. Um, the other thing is, if you're serious about parks, and uh, arts, a lot of cities, uh, that they're violent. You know, it's, it's actually a part of what you do. A percentage of your general fund goes to those things as a minimum. 
so that we don't have this handout kind of thing every year. It's, I don't know if you have that in your bylaws or not, but that's what the city of Spokane said. And the forefathers said, we want parks. So actually 8% of the city of Spokane's budget goes into parks. And it can never be less than that. There have been times when that's been real hard not to get to. It. So if you, if you get a, a council that isn't real crazy about parks, you see what can happen. We don't establish any some kind of criteria in the budget. That's it. You're another minute. We've been uh, we've been really aggressive with uh, this is a, this is a, this is sewer business, so I don't know if this is a public deal. So we've been pretty aggressive with consolidating uh, water districts, and as a matter of fact, uh, we uh, Greenside Water District was about a two and a half million dollar job to, to take a water system that was horrible up there and uh, build a new system, new tanks, new lines from our system. So two and a half million dollars of money. And there weren't that many people up there to pay it. So IJ, and I know he'd be embarrassed if he was here, but the guy does some, some magical stuff with loans and grants. We were able to, through the loan and grant process, get all the money to build that project. It would cost those people nothing for that water system up there. And not only that, but it'll move it you know, along that ridge and come down the other side because there's some little lots down there, which helps everybody. But, you know, we have an asset in our water sewer district that's pretty hard to find nowadays. So we're lucky. We're all lucky. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. Any other comments? Right. Okay. 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 Okay.